Well, welcome back. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. Mm. As you know, I'm your host, Sharon Moore. You know, I always say today, today, today. Well, family, today I got him on the show. Boy, it took some work. Boy, I had to be patient. <laughs> but we got him on the show today. My dear friend, you know, and what a fine bassist he is. You know him. He's a producer. He's a songwriter. He's a musical director. He's a Grammy Award winner. Would you help me welcome my guest today? As I said, in a fine basis, he is Cornelius Mims. Hey, Cornelius. What's up, my brother? Sharon, how you doing, man? I'm well. Welcome to the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. All right, all right, all right. Good to be here, brother. Good yes, to be here. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah I, know we're, I know we're a little pressed for time, so I'll, I'll, I'll dive right in. You're originally from Los Angeles? L.A., L.A., yes. Born and raised. Um, I grew up in the... Um, what what's what they call the South Bay area, you know, Gardena is the city that I grew up in, man. You know, it was a rich melting pot of ethnicity and music in the sixties and seventies, seventies, man. And um, it's just a great, great time and a great area, you know. How did you gravitate to bass as a young man? Well, you know what, the bass was um something that came as an amalgamation of other instruments that I was trying as a kid. You know, um, I think the first instrument I played was trombone. And um, I was also taking piano lessons at the time. This is around age nine, 10. Um, I don't know, really, it was around age 12, around age 12, that I um, kind of first saw the bass guitar. And um Bye, kids. Bye. It's my granddaughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what ends up happening was um, I, I, I first saw the bass guitar, you know, and I didn't even really know what it was. It was by way of a concert that I went to. It was a Jackson 5 concert in L.A. at the Fabulous Forum. And I'll never forget, man, as I was, um, was me and my little sister sitting in the um, in the nosebleeds, and we had binoculars. So I'm looking through the binoculars and I'm scaling down that front line, that Jackson 5 front line. And I'm seeing Michael, Marlon and, you know, Tito, um, all of them, you know, seeing them doing their thing. And I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm really, really mesmerized by what I'm seeing. But as I was panning down that front line, for some reason, man, I got fixated on Jermaine. And at that, it was right at that moment. I told my dad, look, dad, hey, hey, can we talk? I want to be a bass player. I want to play bass. Please tell me, how did you get your start around town, gigging around town? And how did you do with making yourself a name in the in the, in the entry room stages? In the beginning, man, um, what was awesome, man, about the time frame in Los Angeles in my, you know, younger, you know, post high school, you know, the first couple of years out of high school and even through high school, you know, as I said, L.A. was a melting pot, man, of music, ethnicity and, you know, music programs. So there were a lot of strong music programs. The music program at my school, at Gardena High School was strong. And so it bred a lot of and it groomed a lot of great musicianship. And it was really healthy competition going on during, during the, like the, the mid and late 70s and into the early 80s. So what ends up happening is as we, I graduated high school in 1979, um, I tried to do college for a couple of years, but the industry started calling around 1981. I felt very much ready by the age of 18, 19. And so, Please, yeah. Let me ask you this. What was your... What was your first big break? Um, I think the first, gig? yeah, the first big break, and it came by way of um, recording and recording sessions. You know, um, you know, getting into the LA session musician scene. But um, I got introduced to a producer by the name of Freddie Perrin. Freddie Perrin. Freddie was a absolute. I'm talking about, you know, he was like 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 top of the food chain producer um, around that time. He had produced um, 
um, Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. He had a bunch of stuff on um, the Saturday Night, Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. And he was also a, a very major player in the Motown um, production um, scene of, of the earlier 70s. You know, he was a part of that um, production group called The Corporation. Let's talk about your credits a little bit. Let me name a few credits and then we'll talk about TV studio, a little bit of bass talk. I'll mm -hmm. get you out there. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit. Grover Washington Jr., what did you do with him? You know what, man, Grover, there was a a, a project, I, you know, and this is all, we, we're all, it's going back into the 80s now. So, you know, we're talking about 40 years ago. But um, I really got connected to Grover by way of another saxophonist. You know, um, rest in peace, brother George Howard. George Howard, you know, and they're, the Philadelphia connection. You know, so George was out of Philly. And of course, um, George was a mentee of Grover Washington. So I got the gig to play in... Um, George's band. And so George was also a writer in his own right. So he wrote a song that George got placed on a George um on a Grover Washington record. So um they basically called me in, you know, George had me to come in and play the session for the Grover Washington track that he was producing. Oh yeah. Let yeah. me throw another credit at you. Yeah. Lionel Richie. Lionel Richie. Man, listen, <laughs> I can remember the session. I can remember it like the back of my hand, but what song it was, I can't, I can't remember. I cannot remember the, 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 what project that that was that I did with Lionel, you know? You know, I know there's been so many more I have here, but I want to move on. Sure. Destiny's Child, George Michael and Boga. I need another right. two or three times having you on the we'll show a long time. we'll be here a long time bro but i do want to do some of this tv work as well and then we'll go to studio and so on and so forth mm -hmm. uh, uh uh i'm sorry we go to um bass player studio and so forth mm -hmm. a little bit about mm -hmm. uh some of this tv work what's it like playing on soul train what did you do on soul train man i did a few episodes of soul train i did soul train with um philip bailey uh, Philip Bailey had broke off and he had a really, really great solo project, man. Um, back in the early, like around 93, 94. Um, he, um, I don't know if you remember a song he did with Phil. He, he had hooked up with Phil Collins and they did Easy Lover and Chinese Wall. And, you know, it was a really great project. So Philip is a dear friend, man. And back at that time, you know, he called me to put a, put his band together. You know, so our musical director, um, the Philip Bailey um, solo run and um, put his unit together. And so as a result of that, you know, he had a he had a he had a big single out. So we um, we, we we did Soul Train with that. I also did it with L. DeBarge. That was really, really cool. Um, L is my boy as well. So um, and also Chucky Booker. I did Soul Train with Chucky Booker, you know, who awesome. was awesome. Yeah. Let me ask you this, staying in the studio, if it seemed like I'm rushing a little bit, I'm just being conscious of your uh, time. It's all good, man. I appreciate it. But I'm going to get you back where I can slow this thing down and lock it in. It's all Let good. Me, let's, let's stay in the studio just a tad more. You work with Tupac? Oh, yeah. I worked with Tupac, man, a lot. <laughs> How was that? You know what, man? It was kind of bittersweet, man. It was um a dope project. In other words, we were doing some really, really... What well, what was going on uh, now? This was 1995, 1996. Death Row Records, and um, Death Row had taken on a a new look in the in this time. Um, before this was you know before Tupac, you know it was the 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 the, the Snoop, Dr. Dre era, and so that after that era, DJ Quick came in and kind of took over like the the helm of the, the the production of most of the projects. And that's, I was on DJ Quick's team. Tell me yeah. about this one. You won a Grammy. Absolutely. Yeah, this is, um, I'm, I'm super proud of this project, man. Um, this is a, a, a brilliant mind, a brother named by, um, by the name of Xavier DeFrepolaz. 
Xavier de Frepeles, aka Fantastic Negrito. You know, X and I have been working for more than 25 years together, and he's a super visionary dude, man. He writes, he sings, he produces, he, you know, he can actually put a track together himself. But um, what we started working on in the early 2000s, around 04, 05, and we kept trying different projects and coming out with different looks and different vibes. And finally, he, he hit me up and said, man, Corny, I think I got it. I got something, man, that I really want to dive into. I'm calling it Fantastic Negrito. Congratulations on that, man. Thank you, brother. Grammys Thank in you. a row. <laughs> yeah, three in a row. Three up, three Grammys. Staying in the studio just a tad, and I move on to some bass player stuff here. Sure. What tips do you have for the up and coming bass players, even the guys at the next level? I'll mention them again later. But what tip, what studio tips do you have for guys going in the studio and playing bass and so on and so forth on tracks, but, but being in the studio. Okay, well, I'm going to give you a tip that, like I say, I think this is applicable in studio, on stage, everywhere. You know, this is, and it has a lot to do with where I come from, you know, the time frame and, you know, the music that I grew up on. But now bass for me, and let me, let me also add that the bass is the dopest instrument in the band. I don't care what nobody said. It is the most important. It's so important. But now, um, just understanding the role of the instrument. You know, bass is bass. Bass is not keyboards. Bass is not guitar. Bass is not saxophone. Bass is bass. And the role and the responsibility of my responsibility is to, is, is to provide a foundation. Let me ask you this one. What's your least favorite key to play in and why? Oh, man, I don't care about no key, bro. I don't have no least favorite. You know, I like them all, you know. I like, you know, it, it's, you know, songs and, you know, I have this curse. I call it a curse called Perfect Pitch. So, yeah, so, um, and it's a blessing, too. You know, it's also a blessing and it, it bails me out of a lot of the scenarios, but it also makes it, you know, whereas, you know, but but anyway, for me, because of my sense of pitch, you know, um, I don't have an issue with any key uh, in the chromatic scale. Let me ask you this one. Yeah. What do you look for in a drummer and also 
what do you anchor yourself to the drummer? Some people say it's the kick drum. I had one bass player tell me it's the hi-hat. I was surprised to hear that. What do you look for in a drummer? And what do you anchor yourself to as a bass player to the drummer? Oh man, it's just, you know, um, like it's it's the whole, it's the it's the kick snare hat um scenario that that I that I'm I'm always locked into. You know, I like to be set up hi-hat side on you know when, when I'm playing live I always like to be on the hi-hat side you know and I always like to have that you know that I like to have a visual on him too because a lot of times I lock into him visually you know that helps my lock my bass lock and then the other thing that I look for from a drummer any drummer every drummer that I that I that I play with I like them to be just like me foundation first you know, foundation, It's that, that's our job, man. Let's sit on the pocket. And man, I don't care. You know, we can go 96 bars. I'm talking about, I'm talking about 96 straight pocket. And then, and then what happens is if you do a little fill at 96 crossing over into 97, it's going to feel so good because you've sustained pocket for all them bars, all them bars. You've just been sitting on it, man. And then when it comes to 96, to step to get, get, get a pass, right? It's like, wow. And then you back at 97. You back on it, you know? And you'll give it another 96 straight. You know, I like drummers that, just like me as a bass player, that love the pocket. Let's talk a little bit about gear, endorsements or gear. What, what, um, what bass guitar are you playing, strings, amps, so forth? Okay, yeah. Um, I am, um, you know, I've been since the eleventh grade, bro. Since nineteen seventy-eight, a jazz bass guy, a Fender jazz bass, Fender jazz. Jazz is my thing. So, um, I've had, you know, I I I own three Fender jazz basses even today. Um, and then um. It's either a Fender Jazz or a Fender Jazz modeled bass. You know, it's going to have the J bass pickup configuration. You know, I don't really even really do much of the humbucker bass, and I don't I don't mess with the P bass vibe at all. I am a strictly jazz bass kind of a dude. So I've got um um when I record, I have a a, a five string. As a matter of fact, hold up. It's always nearby, man, because I'm always cutting. But this is my um, American Deluxe 5. This is the beast. This is, I, rec I, I, I use this exclusively. I don't record with anything other than my American Deluxe 5 string um, Fender Jazz. And um, I mean, I've been using this bass probably now for 15 years. Um, exclusively, every recording I've done over the last 15 years, the, all the Fantastic Negrito records, all of the Tupac, well, from the Tupac until now. Well, no, no, not the Tupac. Tupac, was, I didn't use this. But that's my exclusive recording base. Cornelius, we do a thing on the show we call Word of Advice. Where yeah. I ask the guests, I ask the the uh, musicians, if they'll leave a parting word of advice for the up and coming bass players uh, uh, that's trying to get traction in this, as I mentioned, trying to get traction in this game, trying to get in the industry here, even the guys at the next level, would you leave them a word of advice? Okay, yeah. Um, wow, man. Um, firstly, learn music, understand the music. You know, and I'm talking about from an anatomical level. You know, what helps me is like when I hear music, I understand it because, you know, even as a bass player, and I would even recommend drummers, you know, when you're playing a song, you know, it helps to know the anatomy of the music. I'm talking about the chord revolutions, the pitches, the tones, to understand all of that. And even, and the rhythms, you know, so I'm talking about the anatomy of the music is super important. You know, and young people nowadays, I, I, I strongly encourage, because see, in my era, growing up in the 60s and 70s, you know, sight reading, you know, rhythms, you know, um, all of that anatomical music stuff, we were taught. 
we were taught it, you know, and in, and even like for myself, you know, having some keyboard knowledge myself, you know, I know the chord constructions. I know my minor sevens, my major sevens, my thirteens, my sharp nine, sharp fives. You know, all of that an anatomical stuff. What do you want your legacy to be? To be said, to be told. Okay. I would like my legacy to be that you know Cornelius Mims made me feel good. You know, when I think about Cornelius Mims, you know, Cornelius is no longer here. But when I think about him, I think of good things, you know, good music, good times, you know, straight up, you know, a good guy, man of his word, man of integrity. You know, I could, you know, accountable, you know, those type of things. You know, those are very important to me, man. You know, so I want people to. I'm I, even in my life now. I, I, I strive to be that, you know. So even you know um, the thing that will live beyond me, also, and I feel very blessed in this are are, are the projects that I've had an opportunity to have a hand in, the music that I've had an opportunity to participate in. You know, these things will live beyond my years here. You know, and I'm thankful and grateful that there's a lot of stuff you know uh, um in the in the um in the um in the discography that can that will carry on carry my legacy uh, let me say thank you so much again i want to get you back soon though maybe in the next couple of weeks okay sure sure let me know all right i'll talk to you soon my friend talk to you soon Sharon. thank you bro god bless bye bye man peace god bless you <laughs>